Greetings in the precious and holy name of our Lord and Savior. Uh, for those who are religious in the house, uh, greet you in Jesus' name. Uh, but today is, a, yeah, it's, a, it's actually an absolutely privilege and honor to speak on behalf of uh, our spiritual parents uh, who are visiting uh, in East London. And we want to thank God for, for them and for their lives and what he's doing in and through them. And thank you to God our Father for giving me this opportunity, giving us this opportunity to speak to, um, to, to, uh, to the family this morning. Uh, d- today is our, in fact, our, our 10th session. Uh, for those who are visiting us here for the first time, we are uh, we're dealing with, uh, it's called the debt elimination, debt er- er- eradication uh, session. And uh, today is our, in fact, 10th installment for this morning. We, we actually said that when we, when we started the series, we went through, and I want to take us some, through some of the stuff that we, we've, do, we've done thus far, that we said, deliver yourself like a gazelle from the hand of the hunter. So, so far, I'm sure that, you know, we've, we all as, as family, uh, we've, we've taken the, the teachings and we've now starting to apply the teachings. So, how many of us are making progress with the debt, debt eradication and debt reduction. By talking to most of you, I'm very pleased to hear that, you know, there's some progress uh, taking place in the house, and which warms my heart that, you know, all of the words and all of the preaching that we've labored and we've done so far is manifesting in your in your lives personally, which is excellent. Uh, so we've done, um, you know, one or two sessions on, on the the kickoff or what causes debt. And some of the things that we spoke about, what causes death was, debt was, um, well, ultimately it'll lead you to death, but what causes debt is, is, not, a spir- is not an economical uh, condition per se. We've said that. We said it is a spiritual condition. So it's not an sp- economical condition per se. We said it is a spiritual one. And we also said that it stems from us being... Um, Entrapped by the God of this world, right? We said that we uh, by the trap of uh, the trap of the God of this world. So we by now we should be better managers. Am I right? We should be better stewards. We should be better managers. We should be looking at our bank accounts. We've we mentioned that. We said we should be looking at our bank statements, scrutinizing them, doing a forensic inquiry. Uh, we should be also be looking at our our, our budgeting. We said, we, we mentioned about budgeting, and I coined the phrase, budgeting like a pro. Because when you budget, you're actually telling your money where to go, and not your money telling y- where you where it is going. So it's, it's very practical stuff that we've been, we've been through and we labored on. Then we also spoke about the credit card, and how the credit card is a very, very big thing, and why it is, it's, it's, um, it's, it's mammon, it's mammonos. And why it is basically can get you into a uh, into a spending uh, frenzy. So we also by now should be curbing our our credit card spending. And I'm glad to hear some of the someone I spoke to last week. What we can uh, testified and told me personally that you know uh, that the bank called up and offered a, a, a another credit card. And by God's grace, she says no. Thank you, but no. Uh, no, th- thank you, but no, thank you. So I'm pleased to announce that it was excellent, and uh, I'm glad that I'm glad that a person person has shared that to me, uh, with me. And then we also spoke about how we could be we should be better givers, because being in debt is uh, should not, you know, promote a non-giving, non-generous spirit. In fact, one of the things that we uh, Randolph has actually labored on five, I think it was about four or five sessions thus far was how, and this was on the premise of uh, Proverbs 19, verse 7, which says this here. It says, the, the, when you lend, when you give to the poor, when you have pity on the poor, you are actually lending to God. So that's another key, another key component of how you can get, uh, get yourself out of debt is by, lend, by giving to the poor, having a heart of compassion to the poor and to the needy. So we've labored. I mean, there's, as Quentin have, has uh, mentioned, please get the tapes and get the, not tapes, sorry, I'm, 
I'm, I'm giving off my age here. Get the CDs. It'll bless you. And there's, there's too much of sessions now to, to, to go through uh, and, and go back and labor on that. But I'm just giving you a summation, especially for those who have come in for the first time. And, uh, you know, we're talking about debt elimination, debt eradication. They might be saying, what is that? So uh, I'm just giving you a summation. Uh, Bron Bronman, if you can put that, that slide on the debt elimination, please. So these are st strategies. Everybody say strategies. Yeah. Strategies on how to get out of debt. And Randolph, as, as I said, labored on giving to the poor profusely. And there were so many, so many keys, so many components there. And I'm, 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 I'm actually th uh, looking at it right now. There's so, many key, so much of keys locked up in the Bible, which also we've mentioned is that one of the key components is accessing the word to eradicate and get, and get us out of debt. Accessing the word, we mentioned that. Accessing the word of God, which is living, which is, 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 is pregnant with, with so much of revelation. All we've got to do is, is open our Bibles, open our hearts. Randolph done, has done, if anybody has not seen that, that or has experienced that session last week, Tuesday, I would recommend it. It is absolutely crucial that you get your hands on that. Click on the YouTube link. It'll take you a few seconds. Click on it. Watch the, watch the session. It, it, it is introductory in terms of how we would access the word and what the word would do. What, we, what are we talking about? We're talking about keys. We're talking about key strategies. We're talking about uh, pin codes, how to unlock unlock ourselves out of debt, how to get out of debt, and how to live our lives like the sons of God that God has intended us to be. We are, ne we are not meant to be slaves. We are not meant to be in this, in this uh, mundane, uh, in and out, uh, playing churchianity. We were meant to be the sons of God that God has created us to be. So I would recommend you get that session, and, uh, and that session actually talks about how uh, Randolph, uh, one of the key men, uh, components was there, or the key text was found in Proverbs um, 25, verse 2, which says this. It says, the glory of God to conceal a matter, but it's the heart of kings to search the matter out. Right? So it's the heart of kings. So if you've got a kingly heart, uh, and by the way, kings in the Bible, like King David, King Solomon, all of these guys had to basically write out the Torah, by hand. They had to write out the Torah by hand. So it means that they knew their stuff. They mean they, it means that they, were, they knew something that we didn't know. You know. And that is why if you look at the Jewish and the Muslim children, or the parents, teach their children about the word. They, t they send them to, uh, to schools to learn about the Torah, to learn about the, uh, the, 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 the scriptures. But when it comes to us, we dumb it down to Sunday school to one hour. That is why I got my children now profusely. I say to him, Caleb, you will, you will study the Proverbs with me. Because this thing, trust me, boy, boy this is going to be, uh, you, it's going to be a grace, grace salvation, and it's going to be absolutely something that you're going to trust. Trust me, you're going to thank me, thank me one day. That's, your greatest, that's my greatest investment that I can give my child and my sons and my children is that I can give them the, the word, the written and, and, the, and the, the rhema, the rhema word of God. And as I said, it's pin codes. If you, for example, if you have a lot of money in the bank, like some of you do, uh, you, no matter what amount you have, it is crucial that you have a pin code. Am I right? Who can access their bank accounts here without a pin code? Then that's like you being like Houdini, and I want to know, know more about you. But you have to have a pin card. These are simple things I'm saying, and I'm using, I want to use some a news example to extrapolate the principle. You've got a pin code. You've got to push in the pin code to unlock that money. You can tell the bank, you know, that's me. This is my money. But the bank, that's one of the, the, the key components of our how you will have to unlock this money of yours and this treasure of yours by using this four-digit or five-digit pin code. So likewise, when it comes to the word of God, there's so much of treasures, so much of benefits, so much of things that are locked up for us, secrets, 
so much of things that are locked up for us as the sons of God, but yet we do not unlock using the PIN code. And the PIN code uh, of our lives is the Word of God. So we said that the Word of God will, will give, us, um, give us that, and it's actually our premise. Matthew 18, 18 says this here. It says, and we use this primarily, this scripture mostly in our lives. I'm sure you've heard that, and where people will say, um, you know, what you bind on the earth will be bound in heaven. And we use that primarily for demonic manifestations <laughs> or to, to, to uh, you know, extract or, uh, or, or, or cast out a demon. But not so. Jesus is talking about here. He says, truly I say to you, whatever you bind on the earth shall be bound in the heaven. And whatever you loose on the earth shall be loosed in the heaven. The word bound and the word bind and the word loose. We got, that's why we, it's very important for us to look at Tuesday's session. Because words in its tr- English translation is so misleading. So misleading. The word bound actually means to, un, to, to, to lock up, to lock up. So whatever you lock up in the, in, in, on the earth will be locked up in the heavens. So whatever you, and the word loose is unlock. So whatever you unlock in the earth will be unlocked in the heavens. So that's my point is that if we dive into the scriptures, and look at the words that God has got, to, got for us as God our Father. And I know I'm laboring on this point, but I know this is a key point and a key, uh, key component on getting us out of debt. Because we could, we could be talking about all the financial aspects about uh, you know, financial planning 101. But if we don't get this right, then all of those things are futile. We have to get this right in terms of Unlocking the treasures, the secrets that God has got locked up for us. Proverbs 25, uh, 2 says this again. I'm saying, I'm, I'm laboring it on, it on it again. It says, it's the glory of God to conceal matters, but it's the heart of kings. How many, how many of us want to be kings? How many of us want to have the heart of kings? I know I certainly want to have a heart of a king to search out matters, and especially bigger, weightier matters. I feel as a church, we, we ain't seen nothing yet. We are just scratching the surface. We are just scratching the surface. There's so much of stuff that's locked up in the Word of God. And I feel that Solomon, for example, that is why it made him one of the wealthiest men on the earth. I think even up to, up to today, no one can actually surpass the wealth of Solomon is because he knew, as I said earlier, he knew something that we didn't know where he was diving into the Scriptures and he was, he was living out the Word of God. So we must de- develop a passion for God's word. Because was Miles Monroe coined the phrase, he said this, he said, it is the manufacturer's manual. It is the manufacturer's manual. Tell your neighbor, the word of God is the manufacturer's manual. It is the manufacturer's manual. Our maker, our God, our father has given us a manual. Now I know I've got a I got a vehicle, and it comes loaded with a thick manual. I haven't gone through that entire thing. <laughs> but I know if a warning light, for example, comes on in that car. It's an old car now. It's about 12 years old. So I'm particularly looking at the manual. You know? So uh, if a warning light comes on on the dashboard, guess what? Guess what, what, what's my first reaction? I don't run to take it to a dealer. Because that guy is going to probably want to sell me a new car. <laughs> so I, I, I look at the manual. Say, look at the manual. Look in the manual. Because the manual will tell you some stuff. For example, it will tell you maybe your fuse, you've blown a fuse. Right? So you don't have to repair an old car if, you, if you've just blown a fuse. So likewise, the manufacturer's manual for us, our lives, is the word of God is the word of God. Some of us blew a fuse, but we, 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 do not, we do not look at the manufacturer's manual. And I think it's very important because everything is in the manual. I, 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 know, I know this for the fact that whatever we're going through, uh, and we're family, I said we're family. So whatever we're going through, whatever concerns, 
whatever heart takes. And Jesse, thank you for blessing us with that wonderful song. Wonderful, wonderful, beautiful uh, words and, and, and encouraging words. So whatever stuff we're going through, it's all loaded. It's all, everything is in the manufacturer's manual. Everything for life and everything for our godliness is in the manufacturer's manual. So, and then last week, Randolph unpacked something major, major, major. And I think was, and it really blessed my heart. Um, so I, I'm, I'm trusting there's no more grumbling. For those who don't know what, what was the message last week, it was uh, the, the formula uh, was uh, G plus C will equal GG. So what is that? First Timothy 6, uh, 6, it says this, Godliness with contentment is great gain. So who, are, who, are, who from us wants great gain? I want great gain for my family. I want great gain for my marriage. I want ga great gain for my children. I want great gain for every facet of my life. So what it is? What's the underlining uh, factor? The underlining factor is contentment. I am happy. I'm, a, I'm, I'm happy with who I am. I'm not trying to be somebody else. That's number one. Your identity is so crucial in this hour, in this day. That is why people are looking for name brands and are getting into debt. That is why people are looking to be somebody else and getting into debt. That is why people want to clothe themselves with somebody they're not and they're getting themselves into debt. This is the world economics we're dealing with. This is not just, a, uh, uh, as I said, an economical situation. This is a satanic attack on the church. This is a satanic, it's a demonic attack, and we are just falling for it left, right, and center. We are falling for it. So what, we, what are we saying? We're saying that contentment with godliness will be your great gain, right? And Randolph labored on it. He says it is, this is, and I feel this is true sonship. This is true sonship, knowing God is our father. No matter what situation we would be, whatever state we would be, we will trust God to be our Father. We will trust Him, and we will not put our, our trust in horses and in chariots, but we will trust in the name of our God and our Father. So He took us on a journey, and, and this morning I just want to say that the, the journey was that the children of Israel, God took them into the, into the wild wilderness, this wild and trackless desert, to teach them one thing. Tell your neighbor one thing, just one thing. He, to, he went, he, to, he took them into the desert to teach them just one thing. And this one thing was, guess what? Was to show them that your reliance, my reliance, should be on our God. And, and thank you so much. That was so on point and blessing to, to me when I, when I heard that the, the table of the Lord, trust the Lord the, in thy God, the Lord and God, uh, with all their soul, mind, and, and spirit this morning. It blessed me because... It just showed, showed me that this, this morning, this message was, um, was, was meant to be and, and is, was, was for us, the sons of God. So this one thing that God took the children of Israel for and into the desert to show them that one thing is to, uh, that, that he is their father. Because remember what he, said to, what he said to Pharaoh through Moses. He said, Moses, tell Pharaoh to tell my people let my son go, my, let my firstborn son go, right? But simultaneously, I feel God should have told Moses to tell the people, tell, your, tell the people to let the God of Egypt to leave their minds because they are so riddled with the gods and the food and the, the Egyptian systems um, that it was, it was difficult. So it's like it, it was difficult to wean off. It's like something like us. We are, we are believers. We are Christians. We are, we are blood, we are blood wash. We are, as I said, we are spiritually, we are sons of God. But sometimes it's difficult. So it's, it's somewhat to say that we've been saved spiritually, but it's our minds that are lagging. Our souls are lagging. Our, our, our souls are playing catch up. So I think God has taken the children of Israel into the desert to show them that they need to wean themselves off the systems of this world. And likewise with us. It's going to be the same thing with us. God wants to wean us off. I know it's going to be 
some tough things we're saying. But if, if we, we cannot play, uh, we can't play both sides anymore. Trust me, we can't play by both sides anymore. This is, this is going to be, this is, be, this is a crucial word, and it, and it really pierced my heart. We can't play, as I said, church unity. We have to choose one God. You either choose the God of this world, or you choose the God of mammon. So, so that's what God has taken the children of Israel to show them, that their reliance and their relying on an economy and a false identity, a false system, was, uh, was not on. So on this debt-free journey, you know, the, the children of Israel left Egypt, but the big question is, as Egypt left the children of Israel. The children of Israel exited Egypt, but the big question is, as Egypt, Egyptian systems has been eradicated, has been totally um, removed from the mind of the soul. And this morning, even as we deal with that, we know that G plus C equals GG. We also know that M plus D equals GD. What's that? Mammon plus discontentment equals great death. Because we know that in the, in, the, in the wild and trackless desert, what happened? God had to wait for these people, and he waited for them. He waited for them patiently because of their disobedience. They saw all God's miracles. Remember that? They saw the Red Sea parting. They, they watched Moses lead them through, in and through. But yet, they were still disobedient. They still grumbled. They still complained. And you know what? Yes, it's very, very, it's very good for us. We can always, and, and it's, it's okay for me to talk about the children of Israel. But the question is, what's happening in me? What's happening in my, my life, my life personally? So that's, that will also be the question for us this morning, that we have to equate our lives in terms of whether we are complaining, whether we are discontented, whether we are absolutely just grumbling about where we are in life and about, uh, about life's uh, challenges. So what, what I'm saying that is that grumbling and discontentment can actually get us into debt. Right? Com the the contentment is a key. Job 36, 11. Bronwyn, can we put that up? If they hear and serve him, they will end their lives in prosperity and their years in pleasure. So this is contentment. This is, this is the key. The key is contentment, which is the opposite of discontentment. Proverbs 19.23 says this here, The fear of the Lord leads to life. Then one rests content, untouched by trouble. So you want a trouble-free life. You want a life that is absolutely protected, free from, from, any, uh, from any trouble. Then I would say the fear of the Lord leads to life. This is true contentment. Psalm 34.10, Those who seek the Lord will lack no good thing. And my favorite was, one is Proverbs 14, 30. It says this, The heart that gives life to the body, but, en but envy rots the bones. So this is the, now the, 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 the opposite of contentment. This is what discontentment contentment will do. So tell your neighbor, be careful about, of grumbling, because grumbling will actually ca it can actually get you into debt. Right? Exod Exodus 16, 2. Exodus 16, 2. Okay, I'm, gonna, I'm just going to read it. It says, in the desert, the whole community grumbled against Moses and Aaron. If only the, the Lord had killed us back in Egypt, they moaned. There we sat around pots filled with meat and all the bread we wanted. But now you have brought us into the wilderness to starve us to death. 
Okay, so th this is the condition of the, of the people of Egypt. It's, it's they remembered what was, uh, what, was, what was given to them, what was given to them in, in Egypt. They remembered. Uh, yet God is now taking them out of slavery, taking them and rescue them, rescuing them, rescuing them as the sons of God. But yet now they're throwing it in God's, on, in God's face and they remembered the spoils of, of Egypt. So how many of us now on this debt-free journey, we are, we, we, we're making progress, but we also simultaneous, simultaneously get, get bogged down by remembering the food and the pleasures of this world? Numbers 11.31. Now a wind went out from the Lord and drove in, in quail from the sea. It scattered them to two cubits deep all around the camp, as far as the days walk in, uh, in any direction. Now, this is amazing that the children of Israel grumbled so much that, and they were discontented, they were, they were complaining, and as Randolph said last week, is that God gave them their desires from a place of discontent, discontentment. May it never be said that God is going to be so fed up with my, my groaning and my moaning that he's just going to give me what I want, but at the same time, I have displeased God. I have, I, I have um, I've made him such, it, it grieved him in his, in his heart. It, it, it's, it caused the wrath of God to, to, to fall upon uh, one's life. Now, quail, it's amazing. The quail, the, 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 the Hebrew word for quail is salav, salav, which means sluggishness, right? So God gave them their request. And may it never be said about us that we actually fall in, into a place of absolute sluggishness. And I feel that the, in the children, in the, in the wilderness, God uh, taught the children of Israel to pick manna every day for six days because he was teaching them how to work, teaching them how to work. And now, because of their complaining and their and the grumbling, they fell prey to a, a, a place of sluggishness. So I would say maintain an attitude of gratitude. Be careful what we grumble and complain about don't be ungrateful for what God blesses you with in the moment. As the children of Israel complained about the everyday manna. They actually, when they saw the manna, they asked God, what is this? Remember that? They asked, what is this? Manna every single day? They complained about getting bread every single day from God. And, and, and God blessed them from the heavens. So the people not only um, remembered the food in Egypt, but they also remembered their gods. You remember in Exodus 19 when God, uh, God took Aaron, um, or the children of Israel, to the foot of the mountain in Exodus 19. Um, Moses went up to meet and speak to God, but the, ch the children of Israel was in the foot of the mount. And we know what, what, what took place there, that the, the Aaron, they asked Aaron to please give us a God. And so Aaron says, reflexively, he said, you know, give me your earring, give me the, the, the earrings from the, from, from the wives and from the children, and we'll put it together and we'll throw it in the fire and out comes this God. So that's how we, and Anne actually mentioned that this morning about the golden calf. So idol worship is the very thing that can actually get us into, into debt. Keeping up with trends. Um, so we might think that today, you know, what are, what are you talking about? Because we don't, we don't, we don't worship idols. We don't worship, worship uh, relics. We don't worship statues. We don't do those things. But our possessions, for example, like our cars, uh, like our sport, all of these things can become an idol. 
unbeknown to us. So that's why the table of the Lord was very appropriate this morning, is that thy shall serve no other God but the God of the, of the Lord of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Let this God teach us his way. So, so, so anything, and this is what, I'm, what I want to say here, anything that actually preoccupies our time, our mind, is tantamount to being an idol in our lives. If anything takes, takes away that precious time uh, from, from, from spending that wo- the time with the word of God. Remember, because of their idol worship, the children of Israel could not be trusted by God. So God had to take them, uh, and, and, and what, what he did is he gave them the law. He actually uh, gave them the indebtedness of the law. The law was their schoolmaster because of their disobedience. So be careful, we must not be possessed by our possessions. Our Father has been given, and, and, and our Father must not, never take a second place in our, in our lives. Because then we can't claim, this, this, if we claim sonship, but God our Father is taking, play, taking the second, second place in our life and, and taking the back seat, then this is not, not true sonship. God our, God our Father must have exclusive rights. And how does, the, how does this happen? This happens when we obey His commandments, obey the principles of His word. This is how this takes place. Jonah, the second chapter, verse 8, says this, Those who regard vain idols forsake their faithfulness. Those who, those who, um, those who regard vain idols forsake their faithfulness. I hear this phrase bantied around quite often, that we must put God first, or we must trust God. We must put God first. And some of the times it's some people that really don't actually... Uh, Obey the principles. They say, put God first. Uh, we hear this a lot, you know. Um, but I would say that putting God first is giving God first position in how we relate to Him by obeying His principles, right? Knowing God is our Father, knowing that you are a son of God, believing that sonship is indeed intact and firm and secure, obeying and practicing God's principles. The, the, the example of this, this case study of this is the rich young ruler. We know that he, um, he, he followed Jesus. He was, he was, his heart was so into following Jesus. He actually asked Jesus, he says, um, can I follow you? And then Jesus says that you must basically um, leave everything and follow me. Sell your possessions. Give it to the poor. And he says, I've done, I've done all of these things. He listed five or six things of the law. But one of the things that he missed out was, uh, was covetousness. And he had a covetous heart. And the, the rich young ruler had a bad combination, by the way. He was young and he was rich. The prodigal son. Tell your neighbor it is... It is not I that is prodigal. Another word for prodigal is an orphan. The, 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 pro, the prodigal son went orphan. He went AWOL. Right? And he, and he basically spent his life in riotous living. In riotous living. Spending money or using resources freely and recklessly, wasted, wastefully extravagant. Prodigal habits are hard to die. Some of the synonyms for prodigal. Wasteful, extravagant, spendthrift, uh, improvident, imprudent, immoderate, reckless, wanton. Wasteful, 
the reason why I mentioned the prodigal son is I, um, I recently had a, uh, a client, and this client was basically, um, we, we've, we've done a whole session on, 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 on debt eradication and uh, all the principles on getting this client out of debt. And uh, why I mentioned the prodigal son is because you can have all of these teachings shared, with, shared and all of the sessions we go through. But if you don't come to your own realization uh, and, and, and come to your own senses, then it will actually be futile. So that's what happened with the prodigal son. He came to his, you remember he was in the pigsty. He was in the, in the, in the testing of his life. And um, he, was, he, was, he was given the, the, the pig's uh, food to eat, and he remembers in his father's house. He remembered in his father's house, hey, you know, my, the servants in my father's house are actually uh, having much more better food to eat. And when he came to his own senses, he went back, and we know that he went back to his father's house. So you've got to come back to your own senses in that respect. Matthew 6.22 says this, The eye is the lamp of the body. If your eyes are healthy, your whole body will be full of light. The eye, of the, the eye, of the, the eye is the lamp of the body. Your eyes are healthy. Your whole body will be full of light. When I did my research... I found that the eye, this eye that God is talking about, is the translation is A Y I N, I -N which is Ayin, right? And remember, we got we got two eyes, two physical eyes. But when I did my research, I found out that this eye that God was talking about was the eye that's found in our souls, right? In our brain. If you had to dissect our brain right now, you'll find that. Uh, there's, there's, a, there's, a, there's a third eye, and that third eye is called a pineal gland, right? Why I'm mentioning that to you is because that, that third eye is actually, they call it the control center or the command center. And remember what happened to Eve, Adam and Eve. When, when Eve took and ate, she saw that the fruit was pleasurable, the, the fruit was desirable, and the Bible says that the, the immediate... Uh, the immediate uh, action of Eve taking the fruit to, to eat, what it did is was it opened the eyes of a soul. So the eyes of a soul was open. And this is my opinion. My opinion is this, is that I feel that this is the very fact, uh, the very thing that opened, gave proclivity to, uh, and, and, and gave, command sent, uh, gave the, 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 the command to this third eye. So why does it, why, why are we talking about the third eye? We're th talking about the third eye is because the eyes of a soul was opened, which means that the, the eyes of a spirit was shut off. The communication between God and God, God, uh, God and man, was cut off. Because remember, when, when Adam was in the cool of the day, um, conversed with God, he conversed with God spirit to spirit, Right? And when she took it, ate, the eyes of her soul was open. Thank you. Daughter coming to my rescue. The eyes of her soul was open. So this means that this is where we get all, our, all of our stuff from in terms of how we think, how we view things, um, whether we are living by the by the lust of the eyes, the lust of the soul, or the pride of life. What is controlling us? Uh, and John picks up on this. He says, are we living with the lust of the eyes, the lust of the flesh, and the pride of life? These are the, the boastful pride of life. These are the things that actually give um, proclivity, as I said, to the, the soulish life. So Isaiah 11 talks about it. So what is the antidote? The antidote is this. Isaiah 11 says this. 
It says, in the spirit, of the, the spirit of the Lord, um, he comes in the spirit of the Lord, talking about the Messiah now, and he is, he is given the seven spirits of God, right? Christ has been given the st- seven spirits of the Lord. He comes out of the stump of Jesse, and he is given the seven spirits of the Lord. And one of the things he's been given is the spirit of lordship, spirit of wisdom, spirit of counsel, spirit of knowledge, spirit of understanding, and the spirit of the fear of the Lord. The, bo- the Bible says the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. Right? The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. And why I'm actually talking about this is that this is, if, if, if we're going to take a key this morning, if anything we want to take from the session, I would say that we need more wisdom. Because the Bible also says wisdom builds a house. And I'm actually asking God for more and more wisdom. I feel Solomon, if you look at it, he nailed it. Uh, you know, he could have asked God, God, God offered, him, um, offered him some stuff. But he says, no, God, I want wisdom. I want more wisdom. Because if you get wisdom, then you get understanding. Right? If you get wisdom, you get everything. So Solomon knew, even in that, I was, saying, I was even sharing with Keller, I said, even in that, Solomon was so wise, even before God gave him wisdom, because he asked God for wisdom. You know, he could have asked God for anything, but he asked God for wisdom. So, so he was on the right track. So I would say that we need more wisdom. Wisdom builds the house. And this is the antidote to us getting out of debt, is wisdom. Wise, wise purchases, wise uh, decisions. The eyes, I can't get that out of my, my mind. The eyes of a soul was opened, which gave uh, an opening to this old new world. The old new world. We were not meant to see, and that word I in, for example, has got a two prong meaning to it. It's got a meaning of good stuff and evil stuff. Good things and evil things. So we were never ever meant to to see what is evil. We were only meant to see what is good. Tobe, good in the Hebrew. Tobe. Right? So the eyes of a soul was opened, gave, gave way to seeing this world, this whole new world that we live in now. And I would say that we need, need the seven spirits of God. And why we, why we need the seven spirits of God is this. Is that when God crucified, when Jesus was crucified on the cross, the, the, the day that he was, de- the, the death, the burial, and resurrection took place, when he was resurrected, he gave the antidote to what happened in the garden. Because what happened when the, was in the garden, the, the morning after Adam took and ate, the eyes of his soul, as I said, was opened. And he, what he lost, what he lost the seven spirits of the Lord. He lost all of these benefits. Spirit of lordship, spirit of wisdom, spirit of counsel, spirit of understanding, spirit of knowledge, and the spirit, of the fear of the Lord. He lost all of these things. But now with Christ coming back, and he's the root, and, and he's the stump of Jesse, he gives us now back these seven attributes from God our Father. Right? These are the seven spirits of God that comes down from the throne of God, which are the seven spirits of God. And I feel, as I said, from one, one, of the, one of the major keys to, uh, for us getting out of our debt uh, and eliminating our debt is, will be more wisdom. Right? Some scriptures, Matthew 6, 25, 24 says this, You can't worship two gods at once. Loving one god, you'll end up hate, hating the other. Adoration of one feeds contempt for the other. You can't worship God and mammon. Uh, at the same time. Matthew 6, 19, 21 says, Do not store up, your, for, uh, up for yourselves treasures in the earth where moth and rust destroy and where thieves break in and steal. But store up for yourselves treasures in heaven where neither moth or, or rust and where thieves do not break in or steal. For where your treasure is, there is your heart. There will your heart be also. The love for money. Tell your neighbor, the love for money 
is a root to all kinds of evil. God deals with money as a medium of transaction, right? But God's, God deals in the currency of grace, not money. Isaiah 55 says this here. 55 1 says this here. Come, everyone, and this is why I'm saying he deals with the economy of, uh, of grace and not money. Come, everyone, who thirsts, come to the waters. And he, and he who has no money, come buy and eat. Okay? Money is a currency of human resources. So the heart that loves money is a heart that pins its hopes and its pursues its pleasures and puts its trust in what human resources can offer. So the love for money is, is a root to all kinds of evil. Right, so I want to offer you this morning, as we, as we, um, as I want to end off in this in this text, is that I feel that this will be an absolute um, uh, major component for us. Is that when we look at our lives and we know that God is our Father, and He's given us a whole new economy, which is an economy of grace. Right, is a higher octane. When you go to fill up your fuel, your car with fuel. Right? It's the same thing as us going to God and filling up our, our tanks with higher octane levels of grace. Right? It's the same thing as filling our lives with absolute fuel for our lives. That, that's what I call grace. It's fuel for our lives. So even as we stand, let us, let us stand and um, lift, up our, lift up our hands and our hearts to the Lord and thank Him. Um, and I want us to do that this morning, is just thank Him uh, as for being God our Father and taking us into this journey, into this, into, out of Egypt this morning, as we would lift up our hands, raise our hands, and thank God for taking us out of Egypt. And the rescue mission was absolutely intact. The re rescue mission was, was bold and it was sure and secure. And uh, as God has taken us out of Egypt, let us not say, what is this, like the children of Israel. Let us not say, what is this, Lord? You brought us into the desert to kill us. You brought us out into the desert to, to, to um, you know, look at the, e the Egyptians. What are, what are they going to say? You've taken us out of, of such a wonderful situation. We've had food. We've had, uh, we've had leeks. We, and they remembered the food that God has blessed them with. So I want us to, this morning, just thank God for what He's given us uh, and a heart of gratitude. Let's, let's, let's just begin to thank God for, and, and, and have our heart of gratitude and have our attitude of gratitude for what He's blessed us with. God, we thank You. We thank You for Your blessings. We thank You, God, for all that You've blessed us with, Father. And Lord, we do not want to be like the children of Israel with a heart of discontentment, Father. Because we know, Lord, if we serve this God called Mammon, then, Lord, this is tantamount to discontentment, which, Lord, will lead us to great loss and great failure. But, Lord, Father, we want great gain. And, Lord, Father, we know, Lord, that great gain is, 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 is tantamount to, Lord, Father, us having godliness and contentment, Father, which will give us this great gain in our lives. So, Father, we lift up our hearts, Father. We lift up our lives. We come before you. And, Lord, whatever is not of you, Father, we ask you, Lord, to, to get rid of those things that are Egyptian systems this morning, Father. Get rid of those things, O oh God, that are holding us back. Father, let us not be people that are looking back and looking at our debt, Father, from a place of where, how we've actually got into the debt in the first place, Father. And Lord, let us not get back into a place of slavery. Um, Lord, we don't, do not want to be slaves, Father. We know you said... The rich will rule over the poor, and Lord, the, the, the borrower will be the slave to the lender. So Lord, we do not want to be slaves to this system no longer. But Lord Father, we want to be called, and we want to be indeed the sons of God. Even as we come up to this mountain, Father, we come up to the mountain of the Lord's house, the Lord of the God of Jacob, so that Lord Father, you could teach us, and we, we could, you could teach us your ways, Father. 
And Lord, that Father, we as the sons of God, Father, we will say no to this Egyptian system and to this Pharaoh. And even as, Lord, we would say that as a people today, Father, let my son go. Let my firstborn son go, Father. And Lord, we thank you for the freedom. We thank you, God, that we are free and we are free indeed. And we are no longer the slaves to this system uh, any longer, Father. So we thank you, Father. We give you the, pre the, the, the praise, the glory, and the honor, Father. And even as, Lord, we know that we come to, the, come to the waters. And Lord, Father, even as you said to us, that we do not buy with money, as Isaiah prophesied, Father. We also, Lord, thank you for the seven spirits of God this morning that you've put in our lives, that will govern our lives, Father. The spirit of lordship, the spirit of wisdom. We need more of your wisdom, Father. As your people, we need more of your wisdom. Uh, if anything, Lord, that is going to get us out of our debt spiral and our debt situation and our discontentment in life, uh, keeping up with the Joneses, uh, living a lifestyle that's not uh, of you, Father. If anything, Lord, we would need more wisdom, Father. So I pray, Lord, build in this wisdom. I right now, Father, saints... I impart wisdom into our lives. I impart more wisdom. Even as wisdom will build this house, God will build us as the sons of God with more and more wisdom. So Father, I thank you right now. I thank you for every family. I thank you for every son that's bowed before us, before you, Father. I thank you, O God, even as you build their lives, establish them, the Father. Even as 1 Thessalonians 5.19 says, Father, that we must... Um, come to you boldly, uh, be sanctified through and through. May our spirit, soul, and bodies be blameless in the coming of the Lord. So, Father, as the saints and, as saints and the sons of God, we thank you right now, Lord, that we will be blameless. We will be sons that are blameless, that our spirits, souls, and bodies will be blameless in our coming of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. So, Father, we give you all the praise, all the glory, and all the honor you deserve as God our Father. Thank you first. Thank you in Jesus' name.